Okay, Kyle? We're good. Oh, yeah? All right. Perfect. All right. Well, I'll just call the uh, San Valley Test Meeting meeting to order at 12.03 uh, p.m. Eastern. Um, so I guess first order of business is to approve the meeting minutes from uh, October 14th. Um, I know I just sent that out to you guys only a few hours ago, but did Stephanie and Billy have a chance to review the, con <laughs> the concise and informal meeting minutes? <laughs> but I will remain. Yeah, I forwarded them to you, I think, about an hour, hour and a half ago. Yeah, guys, I thought I'd come in. I just was doing other stuff. Uh, there we go. Do you want to, you can do it at the end. I'll be yeah. on the topic. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so today, um, well, welcome everyone. We kind of made it through. This is our last, like, topic-specific meeting. Um, so kind of just blew through all of the sustainability uh, issues. So congratulations to all of us on that. Um, so today, yeah, we're talking about social equity, trying to keep a focus on kind of the theme of you know, the United Committee of Sustainability, even though social equity kind of, you know, crosses all the um, uh, spectrum of everything. Oh, sorry, also, by the way, on the call, we have Kyle Harris from the CTV, Stephanie Smith, uh, Billy Coster, Jacob Alter, Gina Cramingle, uh, and Jeffrey Gallows um, from the um, from NACB and the uh, committee, and then joining us as a top level expert community member is Graham. I am not going to try to pronounce your last name, but um, with the rural Vermont, Unox, Um So thank you for <laughs> Um, yeah, so, um, kind of, uh, in the agenda, I sent out, you know, large macro level topics, um, and then kind of just eat everyone into, you know, just a little bit of what I'm thinking. So, you know, open, open forum on this. Um, I guess to start, and Gina, Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys have now agreed upon a definition of social equity, um, which includes, um, uh, BIPOC, so uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and um, uh, disproportionately impacted by prohibition. Um, and did you guys put in a um, poverty or uh, social, uh, economically disadvantaged clause as well? No, we put it in um, as someone who was incarcerated or, you know, was arrested due to the war on drugs or their family member. Okay. Yeah, and just for uh, the... Uh, and I'm creating a diversity, equity, and inclusion program, um, and then we might tackle um, low social economic uh, people at that time, um, but it, it didn't make it on, on social equity track. Okay. And I think just, just adding quickly to, to Gina's comments, you know, there was a proposal um, or discussion on including folks um, that live in opportunity zones, economic opportunity zones in the state of Vermont to um, be eligible for a social equity applicant um, license. And the board just felt, based on where those zones are in Vermont, that they could invite some some folks to take advantage of the program that um, otherwise should be directed towards the traditional um, application process, and so we just we felt that we could we could really work with low income poverty folks in different ways to kind of make uh, accommodations in other parts of our program. So that was a, a decision that that the board did make. And I just I, I want to add just one more thing. I think is is good bit of table setting for this conversation and, and I've said time and time again to this committee that we can't, we, we're tasked with doing a lot to help small cultivators except the one place that we can't make any exceptions for small cultivators is in the environmental context. That being said, that language isn't the same as it relates to social equity. And so how, in the environmental context for social equity applicants, how can we more than just waive fees by providing business and technical assistance. You know, um, I saw some of your agenda, um, Jacob, like accelerator programs, other type of, of 
thoughts and ideas that we can help you know folks from an environmental justice perspective and I, I think it's really important and I'm glad that we're that we're talking about it here today yeah thank you um, I would add for I think argue our conversation state of also considering um, in social equity conversation like legacy growers and elderly um, you know I would say not necessarily like all small cultivators but I think there's definitely disenfranchisement with you know the way kind of um, you know elder rural uh, farmers you know are uh, in you know and especially in the death cycle and all of that so I think kind of keeping that in mind um, so I guess getting right into it um, I was thinking like technical supporting guidance so how's I was kind of thinking about this and, and reviewing you know what's out there on social equity and you know, what I've seen in the industry is you know, specifically from like uh, all the social equity applicants, but I think there's going to be a lack of resources, um, a lack of institutional knowledge, um, essentially lack of cultivation knowledge, um, and so anything that the CCE can do to support um, you know, getting them into the system, so like actually having real opportunity, um, and then having real. Uh, you know, participation, I think it's going to be really important. Um, you know, I was just going over some stuff and I was saying, like, there's uh, like 30,000 um, kind of cannabis business owners, you know, 2% potentially are um, black owned. Um, and then in specific states, I think it was like Illinois, I think it was like eight, I think, I'm not going to butcher it, but very few, I would say under a dozen, you know, applicants have actually gone through the process and been awarded a license. And so I think there's definitely um, a barrier just within navigating the system. Um, so how to fill out the application, legal support, you know, what compliance even looks like because they've been out of the system for so long. So I think you know that's kind of what I was uh, wanting to explore uh, with everyone on that, and then just kind of technical, you know, expertise on like cultivation and manufacturing, um, realizing that they most likely haven't been doing that and. and or the recently incarcerated or just incarcerated or, you know, um, the ones affected on the war on drugs, you know, that definitely affects employment. And so having even opportunities to, you know, have employment in any kind of, you know, farm or, you know, industry, I think, you know, I've taken into consideration as well. So I think it's just a lack of knowledge. Um, yeah. So if anyone have any thoughts or anything to kind of add to that or get a little bit more granular? So Jacob, those are definitely things that were considered with the social equity um, subcommittee. And one of the major things that we thought that would be really great is for our educational courses. And um, we've already been in talks with Green Flower, um, as you know about the certificate courses that they have for cultivation, but also extraction, um, retail. Um, look, would love for you to look at the cultivation one because you know they really go extensively into you know water and other practices in there to really give them that wealth of knowledge mm -hmm. um, and I know that that is something that Green Florida wants to try to make available for the state of Vermont. Great yeah no, uh, I think um, that's what I was thinking about with like the workplace diversity support like vocational training. Um, and then and then also doing co-ops were spoken about that um, has been recommended to the subcommittee as well that I know we'll be discussing today. Perfect, yeah. And I wanted to explore the co-op and how Vermont is kind of viewing that. Um, uh, Stephanie, Billy? I, yeah, I, I don't know who Green Flower is necessarily, so maybe it would be, you know, to share a little information about them. But I also know that in the state of Vermont, um, we do have some educators <laughs> that educate on cultivation. Um, they may be affiliated with um, schools that otherwise might may or may not be able to um, provide educational courses specifically for the cultivation of hemp due to some you know restrictions. But um, but I guess I, I want to you know in addition to to what resources may be available outside the state, I also want to encourage to look at what resources are available within our state um, so that we, you know we're growing 
organically using the people that currently reside here, and maybe maybe they do <laughs> um, this, this organization um, who do have expertise uh, in this um, area. Quickly, uh, yeah, just uh, real quick. <laughs> no, Jacob, you're on. Um, you're on the show. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No worries. No worries. I was just going to say on, on that point of um, how I use World Bus. Um, is the agricultural extension services in, in Vermont and the master grower stuff to be able to um, essentially take on some of this? So, I, I, I mean, I'm not going to speak for museum extension, um, but uh, and, and Heather Darby can certainly weigh in or the CCD can reach out directly to her. Um, but my understanding is they may not be able to provide classes in cultivation of cannabis specifically due to funding. Um, courses. Uh, VTC has also offered um, classes in hemp cultivation. Um, Kyle actually uh, knows, <laughs> uh, has attended some of their sessions uh, as well as I have relative to hemp specifically, but um, but there are educators. So uh, VTC is the other school that comes to mind. Um, it is the least state school. But, um, yeah. So. Yeah, very, very quickly, because one of the first things I did when, when I took this job on was starting to reach out to our in-state business and technical assistance providers. So I've spoken to Heather, um, you know, nobody was exactly sure, and I got to follow up as we move, you know, we pivot towards the program standing itself up to kind of gauge where people are. I think Intervale is another um, service provider. I, I talked to them. Um, and they felt that they could kind of compartmentalize their funding to be able to help um, folks in this industry, which is very encouraging. Um, I haven't made contact with, um, and I see Graham's hands up, and he's going to have a lot to say here because I know he knows all these folks as well. Um, I've spoken to VTC. They seem excited. Um, again, just need to, need to follow up. I have not reached out to the Vermont Housing and Con Conservation Board. Um, because I, I feel and I've heard that their funding is so intertwined twined to federal resources that it just might be futile um, to figure it out. But so, so we have made contact in the state, Jacob, to see what's here, and Gina, to see what's here to, to help folks. Um, everybody's a little bit unsure because it's kind of uncharted waters, um, but um, you know, the time's coming to kind of reach back out and see, see what else is, uh, see, see what progress folks have made. Yeah, yeah, just on um, Kyle on the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, you know, they manage the Vermont Farm and Forest Viability Program. That would probably be the most relevant here, providing technical assistance, marketing, and things like that to enterprises. I think a lot of that money does come from the state. I know they have some federal funds, but I think a reasonable part of their budget is, is state funds. So yeah, they have may not be totally. They have a they have a state appropriation. It's just getting us lined up with their agenda and appropriation, and making sure we can slide in without you know other funding that, that's already taken up that that time. Um, also, the Working Lands Enterprise Board, who you know is a is a joint venture between Forest Parks and Rec, ACCD, the Agency of Agriculture, um, on getting money and support to folks that that are operating on the working lands. I think I used to help manage policy decisions at that board at my time at Ag and, and we were working to get hemp into that into that program. Um, and I know the director fairly well as the Stephanie. Um, so hopefully when the time comes, um, you know, we can work to to insert this program into there and get get uh, grants and forgivable loans to folks that want to make improvements um, at their business. I know Graham probably has a lot to say and a lot of yeah. thoughts here. So I wanna I wanna acknowledge his hand is up. Yeah, definitely. Graham, real quick, I just want to ask Billy, what was the name of that uh, department? Uh, it's the Vermont Farm and Forest Viability Program. That's part of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, uh, which Kyle has alluded to. Thank you. Uh, Graham, floor is yours. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I've got a few thoughts to share. I think I think the direction of the conversation that Kyle's pointing is important to me and our organization. You know, I think that there's big decades of, of expertise in our growing community, the breeding community, here in the state, in the farming community. And I think we can draw from all those folks who are still keeping their heads down to be the experts to teach us. It's another, it's another opportunity for those folks to be, 
to be drawn into this, right? To be given opportunities to provide their technical support to other folks. And people are doing that. Um, they're just doing it in different ways right now. So I think, especially when it comes to outdoor cultivation, given the really unique climate of Vermont, those folks are really important to bring on board. Um, I can't speak to specific, specific funding streams, limitations, but Kyle and Stephanie and folks are getting into, but I think I'm really glad to hear that you've reached out to those folks. Kyle, um, you know, as a farmer who works with the InterVail Farm Viability Program, I think one of the ways they're a little different from extension is in that they, you know, they're not just going to solve your problems for you. They're going to pick you up with people who can work on your problems with you. And that could be someone who's going to help on you in your branding, someone's going to help you in your business planning, someone's going to help you on your greenhouse cultivation, someone's going to help you on sourcing. They can, they do the work sort of finding the experts to bring to you. So it's part of the work that the CCB could be for making it safe for those experts to sort of show themselves and become more available. Um, this community that's, that's something to think about and just to back up in a minute you're asking more broadly about some of the ideas around social equity and, and programs and such you know and in our recommendation um it's hard for me to go through them all right now on my phone given i'm with my daughter um but we get into um we can definitely get into a, a uh, an incubator type program, um, as you mentioned. Um, I do know that I think Castleton actually might have a cannabis cultivation program in and of itself. I think the college to reach out to, and Jeffrey Pizzatello from our organization is in touch with those folks, and, and they might be worth reaching out to. Um, but certainly, you know, an incubator program. Um, we also talk about you know, programs for race and land access, which I think is really critical. Um, and some of our programs are also broken up by community. So you, you spoke a lot about who is included in the social equity definition. And I think it might be if you were spending some time and devoting some resources to, to, you know, how different people in the category are treated differently, perhaps. Um, for example, we broke out, you know, a whole piece on specifically for eligible black individuals based on racial equity, you know, apart from the broader social equity category. Um, and there's, there's certain different, different communities have different needs and different histories um, that that result in them getting stuff in that social equity program category. And I guess the last thing I would say is, um, it was interesting to hear you say, Kyle, that the small farmers is where you aren't allowed to make any differences uh, from an environmental sustainability perspective. Uh, yeah, let me, let, me, let me clarify that, Graham. 164 says we can make special accommodations for those considered small cultivators, so the 1,000 square foot indoor and outdoor cultivators, but the exception to that accommodation is that we cannot make special environmental sustainability considerations for that class of cultivators. So that, that's written in statute. Right, and, and, you know, and that's a, I'll just say it to you, not that you on your task, but I, I think that's just a really erroneous idea and to, to include in statute. You know, we have scale appropriate regulations all throughout agriculture and, you know, whether it's, you know, the requirements for a retail store where you're only selling your own product on your farm versus a, a retail store in the community, or, you know, whether it's the energy requirements for, you know, building, you know, when you're, when you're working with an agricultural structure or you're working with an agricultural structure. And I think it's really important to keep in mind the positionality of both and how those situations really have different needs. Um, but you know, I'll leave it there given that, as you said, in fact, you can the message to the legislature as well. well. Graham, I have a question uh, for you. Um, more like um, on the point of thinking like uh, you're, you know, small farmer potentially coming into this industry and what concerns has a teaching kind of do you have already without even knowing the layout as far as like application compliance like getting in an application um that would be beneficial to have resources for yeah i think that's a really great question i, I totally neglected to mention as part of that but if you look at our recommendations that we submit to the ccb um we certainly emphasize legal support i think the legal side of this is is really unique you know clearly from other industries and it's a even if you've negotiated starting your own business and filling applications in the past, there's just so many aspects that I think are still unclear, a lot of us. And access to legal support, in particular for communities who are economically disadvantaged, who, you know, um, for racial equity purposes, et cetera, are really important, um, small producers. I think about legal in particular, almost more than anything else. I think the, the capital side is going to be really interesting depending on you know, how easy it is to produce outside. You know? whole process is 
Um, but you know, as, as a farmer who's worked, who talked with you know the Intervale Extension, et cetera, we know in the RAP Development Committee, which is the required agricultural practices development committee, we heard over and over again just that depending on what farmer you're talking about, like www, they might not even know what that means. Um, so like the real in-person support available to help support people through online processes or otherwise. You know, those processes, even if they seem simple to some folks, can be really challenging to others. And if we have, if this is gonna be, end up in the industry that our coalition wants to see where you can have farmers who are saying, as you were saying, Jacob, there's a particular positionality economically that a lot of farmers have in this country that's been negative, negative $1,400 national average income for, for farmers. Um, if they wanted to add a, a small bit of diversify their, their income on the side, you know, the ability for farmers of all types to be able to negotiate the application process, the legal side of it, will be really important. And I think it's a whole other thing when we get to the black owned business side of things. Um, and for there, we need even more support. Um, and Mark, Mark really emphasized that in our work, you can see that in our recommendations as well. I mean, and another, you know, one of the primary concerns I have as someone who would be thinking about getting into this is, you know, Basically, I just question whether or not it's worth getting into it. Just someone who's already doing this, what is in it for you to get into it legally right now? If you can't market your own product, if it's going to cost you a lot more, it's going to be a hassle, and you might actually be sticking your head up and then get your license denied, and then you know have to keep doing your thing underground, put in a more vulnerable position. I think people are going to feel really compromised coming into this for other reasons, which are sort of outside of the purview of this committee, perhaps. But I think the stuff you were talking about, making sure there's very substantial support for applications, for legal support, et cetera, is gonna be really important. Thank you, yeah. Um, I, I, even before starting to do this, when talking to Kyle, I mean, I, I had mentioned, you know, one of the best things I think that Denver has done um, within the last couple of years was to have a specific kind of, um, I would say like, cannabis industry and government liaison, because you know, regardless of how all of this rolls out, there's going to be so much gray areas, and having an advocate, so to speak, that's from the government side to help facilitate these things is going to be really important. Um, and I just really want to highlight something you had said. Um, also, I think it's important is, is um, you know, outreach to the individual categories uh, of social equity. I think it's going to be really important um, because if it's just in, you know, local newspaper or on the CCB website, most social equity applicants are not going to ever find that information, and so I think reaching them um, where they're at is going to be really important as well. Um, anything else to add real quick before we move on to the next uh, item? So Jacob, um, the subcommittee is recommending a social equity board, and one of their responsibilities um, is going to be doing community outreach and education about the program that will be set up by the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Um, and majority of those candidates actually are coming from those communities that are, have been most impacted on the war on drugs. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, I have one more comment. Um, Kyle did talk about the Working List Enterprise Initiative in the state of Vermont, the state dollars that go to assist um, farmers and, and forest um, uh, product manufacturers. Uh, it also includes the technical assistance um, piece, so it's not just the businesses, but you can apply for technical assistance money to help others in the business. Um, so the, I just wanted to share that particular piece. Um, I do think that they set priorities uh, every year, maybe, um, or every other year with respect to who they're going to fund. Um, and so people potentially could apply to the Working Land Board to get funding to provide technical assistance to those that are interested in entering um, this market. And it can be, you know, that technical assistance can be specific for any group of people as well. It can be designed by Thanks, Stephanie. I completely blanked on that specific grant that the Working Lands Initiative does, does offer because I've reviewed those applications myself. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would say on the note of funding, it's a little out of our purview. I would just encourage, if even possible, to try to get Vermont to use some of the cannabis uh, tax dollars that are being generated to fund some of these initiatives. Um, I think that would be fantastic. Um, so just throwing that out there. Um, I'd say next um, is kind of 
access to appropriate land or infrastructure, um, thinking, you know, the actual availability to get uh, a piece of land to farm or a building to lease to do it um, is going to disproportionately uh, affect uh, social equity applicants. So some of the things that have come up um, have been like, do not require leases prior to approval. Um, I think that's really important for social equity applicants because a big issue and a big I guess, financial barrier is for most states, um, you need to have property under contract before you submit your application and then you can wait anywhere from three months to over, you know, a couple of years and where's that money coming from? Um, and so I think it's a huge, you know, burden. Um, and then also, I forgot to mention this, like what Graham was talking about and considering whether or not to the cannabis industry and the application process, we, from experience, we're not even planning to touching, but, you know, once we started making inroads in the cannabis uh, community, you know, all of our banking accounts got shut down. Um, and so I think, you know, even at the putting application, it could have detrimental effects to, you know, all of that stuff. So I think um, any kind of speed support or guidance on that um, within the local banks, um, you know, had a lot of success with uh, community supported banks um, and, you know, insurance stuff I think would be um, really important as well. And then I wanted to ask you, Kyle, I don't know if we're there yet, um, but are there requirements on the application process for renting, leasing, uh, land or buildings? No, there's not any requirements. Um, we can talk about additional baseline requirements uh, or how to, you know, thread that needle. I guess towards the end of this meeting on, on that part of the that part of the agenda, because I'd love to, to hear perspectives. Um, I'm likely going to be making some recommendations to my fellow board members on additional baseline application requirements on Friday. So getting a getting a sense of what we think is prudent um, to ask as part of like an application checklist when somebody does um, submit their information and their application for a license. So what do we need to see at the time versus being overly overly burdensome and prescriptive. Uh, but getting back to, to one of your, your comments, I know we, I heard the word co-op mentioned at the beginning at, at some point during our conversation. I know that you know various board members, myself included, have done some outreach to, to folks with expertise in farmer co-ops in and around the state. There's a lot of different models out there. And I will say that our exploratory committee, which will be convened today for the first time, has, has a lot of different special license types to explore, but one of them is a cooperative style license, and that likely will be included. A recommendation on how to make that work will be included in our January report, is my understanding, to the legislature. Gotcha. Um, that's good to hear. Um, I was I was gonna, um, yeah, I would just say for looking at requirements, having social equity applicants, um, the most flexibility when coming, uh, when dealing with securing property, et cetera, I think it's gonna be really important. Um, you know, we you see it kind of in every state, but it's always this like cannabis tax that goes into place. You know, most um, uh, leases, at least in Colorado, were kind of like five years, and then once that came up, uh, everything shot through the roof and it really uh, impacted the not so, you know, well off uh, um, applicants, especially because most of the funding capital you're going to be able to raise is going to be coming from individual private investors since you don't have access to standard uh, banking. Um, so just keeping that in mind that I think a lot of things are going to change on the ground and being able to have the flexibility, which I would imagine from a real team indoor or at least more in an urban environment is going to be you know limited zones so limited areas to actually be able to uh, conduct business yeah and just just i hate to belabor the point of our exploratory committee because i don't want it to seem like it's a laundry list of every miscellaneous kind of committee of, of stuff we haven't gotten to yet but i know the cannabis and stephanie will be on this committee it's my understanding right stephanie but the cannabis tax and that specific circumstance that you're alluding to jacob that could happen you know, after the first wave of, of leases are up and, and our program is starting to reach maturity and folks having that, that issue, that that is on the list of first things to address for that committee. Okay. Heard. Um, I, you had mentioned the insurance earlier, Jacob, um, and while I know nothing about insurance, I do know, and I don't actually know what it means, but 
Vermont has a captive insurance like niche. <laughs> I don't know what captive insurance is, <laughs> um, but there was a comment that was submitted earlier in the formation of the Cannabis Control Board um, from someone named Stephanie Mace out of Burlington that participates in the um, captive insurance industry. Um, and she was talking about how they could maybe help out relative to insurance for cannabis. Like it was actually offering a, hey, we can be a part of this. Um, so I think this individual, Stephanie Mace, is who needs to be contacted because I know nothing about it. But I just remember the comment and I wanted to um, remind um, uh, the board, Kyle, about this. Thanks, Stephanie. And, and as it relates to banking and insurance, uh, Pepper has been really taking the reins on all of that stuff. We've talked to everybody from BSECU, which is the Vermont State Employee Credit Union, other small credit unions, state um, chartered banks in the state to kind of gauge their thoughts, perspectives on, on providing financial assistance to those that are interested in this industry. Uh, I don't know how far from an inroad perspective he has made in the insurance side of that equation, but I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with him to kind of see, um, see if he's talked to Stephanie. Right. Well, our Stephanie is our neighbor at a Burlington house, so I know her quite well. So uh, I'm happy, we'll be back up in Burlington next week, so I'm happy to talk to her um, informally about opportunities there. But uh, we let Pepper do that, but you know, she's, a, she's a friend and a neighbor, so awesome. she's a resource. Thanks, Billy. Yeah, I was just say on the insurance, I know way too much about cannabis insurance uh, than I've ever wanted to, uh, but a lot of it comes from, you know, originally still kind of happening. Um, you can, you'll get insurance brokers and insurance underwriters will underwrite. Um, there's no insurance for like crop loss because it's really, you know, a federal thing, um, but you can get insurance for much everything else. And so they'll sell you a policy, but in that policy it'll say, um, you know, claims cannot be made on any federally illegal, you know, uh, drug so there is immediately unenforceable, like you can't actually do anything with it. Um, so it's kind of like shady practices, a lot of that slowly being, um, you know, moved out of the industry. Uh, I know California kind of created with Golden Bear insurance. Um, so there's just opportunities that be there from the state of Vermont to make sure that insurance companies are actually providing coverage to this industry. Um, and, you know, helping to facilitate all of that. Uh, that's what I was, what I was bringing that up for. Um, yeah, I mean, that is going to be a huge expense for any social equity candidate. So it'll be really interesting to see if there is any state um, facilitation that can happen with that. Because insurance for any time you have cannabis is double or triple the prices it's even more and a lot of many times a lot of insurance is not even possible or it's so expensive it's better not to have the insurance mm -hmm. um, for cannabis and we, we see that in every sector and kind of yeah the other reason i, I was kind of bringing this up which kind of goes into expungement support um as well <laughs> is just realizing that people and the applicants um are going to have you know a hard time getting any of this uh, financial, legal, insurance, you know, coverage to begin with, and then let alone being in the cannabis industry. So anything I think the CCB can do um, to support that is going to be really important. Um, okay, I think kind of um, we're already kind of over a little time for this section, but I think it's important. Um, wanted to bring up, I guess it kind of goes into accelerator model, um, mentorship, um, kind of incubator stuff. Um, but, you know, there's the last prisoner project um, that I'm quite familiar with. Um, but part of that is to get prisoners who've been incarcerated due to the war on drugs um, be able to, one, get out of prison, get expungement, but then also get employment in the cannabis industry if, want, you know, if that's something they want and um, you know, facilitating that so kind of goes back into the vocational um, aspect of it. Um, but I think it's important to um, you know, address that for socially uh, uh, you know, social equity applicants as well, is that there's probably still a whole bunch of people um, in jail for uh, cannabis crimes um, that 
should hopefully be getting out with legalization and that ideally should have an opportunity to participate in this uh, um, you know, industry and so thinking that the jail prison system, you know, is state run as well. Potentially there is some like in prison technical vocational support that could happen as well. Um, and preparing uh, people uh, to get into this industry. So there's an opportunity there to, you know, help correct past uh, issues, but then also, you know, save the state money by providing these people with training and jobs when they get out or are on probation, et cetera. I want to say we don't have anyone representing the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, but I believe they have Vermont worker training programs like ACCD, who's involved in the um, Dangerous Act uh, or in the law as well. Um, but they, they have programs that include worker training and um, they may have accelerator programs. I, and I don't know where the funds come from, they might be limited, but if they're state funded programs, then maybe um, there's the ability to. To provide training. <laughs> yes, Stephanie, ACC, yeah. AC, ACCD, the Department of Economic Development, does have like an uh, apprentice worker training program, and I think a guy named John Young works or runs it. I can follow up with him. As far as incubator and accelerators, I mean, and, and I'd love for Graham to jump in here, there is a lot of ones in the ag sector that, that really look to foster small businesses and help them rise above that kind of startup level. You know, my mind goes to like the Mad River Food Hub and Waitsfield and, and, and others. Um, there's a lot of folks that are interested in that kind of community aspect, how they feel about this emerging market. I, I, I'm less familiar with because I haven't had those conversations with those specific organizations, but there is a robust, that kind of sense of community here present in other, other parts of the ag portfolio. Yeah, I was thinking of Vermont um, Businesses for Social Responsibility comes to mind as a nonprofit, um, and then Ellen Taylor's group, but they're you know, mostly focused on ag. I, I don't know what their interest is. I mean, at food production, um, and I don't know what their interest is in participating in this space, but. Um, I, know, I know Ellen fairly well, because I did that whole report the future of whatever it's called, food and agriculture in the state, I can't even remember at this point, with her, and I know that she's curious. I haven't had the conversations with her to see how the Farm to Plate Network and, and the um, how they might be, be willing to, you know, help connect the dots or, or support this uh, this emerging industry. Yeah. Grandma know, though. <laughs> Grandma know. Grandma know. Well, I would say first of all, I'm just really glad to hear you all talking about you know, our recommendations. We certainly had a job training program for reentry in particular. Um, and, you, you know, I don't, as far as I know, I don't know if there's any agricultural program that's specifically connected with reentry program. I would be really curious to find that out, I think. Um, but I think by touching base with the criminal justice reform community, you know, I imagine those are folks working on reentry reform, working on work, you know, means of meeting those people's needs and they're working with the people who are already providing some of the job training and reentry options and, and to you know start feeling out what the opportunity is for either you know providing some training to those folks similar to who we provide training to ag advisors so that they at least be able to um, if they can provide training activities themselves that they know have who to hook them up with how to support them finding those people and help them along that process that's, that's the best I have right now. Uh, makes me think about the you know capstone community action as well. But I think the criminal justice reform organizations would be based to look into. And I'm sorry, Mark's not here to be able to address that. You might have Perfect. Thank you. Um, and the other thing I was gonna, um, where I got inspiration for the accelerator model is when they just passed in Denver um, when they you know realizing that we were still very few uh, black minority owned cannabis companies out there. Um, they did a whole bunch of social equity work this past year, or in 2020, I came into effect. One of them was an accelerator model um, to get, uh, kind of like ease the process to through the application process, but it was also pairing of established cannabis businesses with these new social equity applicants. Um, and then the um, established business got a social equity leadership designation, which essentially just like had some favorability if there was any 
compliance issues or whatnot. Um, you know, I think there might be opportunity as this is, you know, forming a potentially more established, um, you know, community members who are applying to agree to mentor social equity applicants in exchange for either some kind of application incentive or, you know, favorability on, you know, Lucy's moments, kind of things like that. Uh, we just kind of wanted to throw that out there as an idea. Um, I don't know if anyone has anything to add to that, otherwise we can kind of move on to, to home group. Sure. Hey, Susan. Absolutely. Um, this is getting back to our last subject, and I just acknowledge ahead of time that data is not in your purview, but when we're talking about insurance, and we're talking about banking, um, and Billy, Billy might recognize this from our, my organization, the Climate Council, um, but it, you know, this contributes further to, I would say, just larger systemic issues that the case for a state bank in Vermont. Um, you know, farm, farmers in South Dakota were responsible largely for forming their state bank in the 1900s, and I think for a number of reasons, a state bank um, would function very well, but I'll leave it there and just say that's something to consider in your broader recommendations or thoughts with you all. Yeah. Um, no, I agree, so I think we'd be awesome, so it's just for processing. That is always going to be with the uh, recreational or retail cannabis is finding a processor to actually process the transactions. That's why most everything is cash. Um, and uh, and that, that being of itself is also another burden. Um, but uh, just throwing that out there. Um, home grow, I don't feel it's necessarily in our purview, uh, but some of the things I saw that I thought would be um, good to bring up is just one, um, you know, access to medicine for, you know, high poverty individuals um, is going to be important. Um, and so potentially having a home grow be able to share a small amount um, within their community um, to economically disadvantage uh, people, I think would be a really nice thing. Um, and then also from a home grow perspective, making sure that code enforcement um, and enforcement in general um, has been recommended to be a municipal code enforcement officers and not armed police. Uh, so you're not kind of perpetuating um, the war on drugs uh, you know, system again. But anyone have anything to add, Gina? Let's see your hands up. Um, so I just wanted to ask this committee because I know one of the major issues that we're going to have with some social equity candidates is that they rent their property so they can't necessarily do homegrown unless um, they're allowed by their landlord and so how does the state of Vermont kind of go around that or if it's even at all possible? Um, it's just tied to the greater 
um, impact the systemic racism because we know they're going to play out disproportionately in this coming market. So that's one way we can also get about trying to tackle it by you know, going from funds from this to tackling impact of systemic racism outside of this industry as well. Um, yeah, so I I guess comment on each one of those. Um, so how to deal with landlords, I think that I, I, I deal with that situation currently right now as well, um, is uh, I think there is an opportunity for the CCB to um, put out education materials excuse me, um, on that and actually on like what the actual risks are as a homeowner, um, basically what the benefits are, but essentially do a destigmatizing campaign um, around home growing. I think it's kind of as far as the state to really go with that. And then on the disproportionate enforcement of, of, of crimes, et cetera, I think that kind of going into making sure the CCB is tracking this data and tracking meaningful data um, on things and then publishing it. And so, you know, granted that might not be the purview of CCB, but as being the cannabis control board, I'm sure you have a liaison with enforcement agencies um, to make sure that data is being tracked so that, you know, it can come to light if this is, you know, if this is going on. So that's the only way to make meaningful change in a political environment. Um, so I think you kind of, you know, goes along with how many, you know, social equity applicants are actually getting, how many are actually being licensed, et cetera. I have a couple of thoughts, comments based on this part of the conversation because I think it's it's interesting and important. And I mean, one of my first thoughts to Dina's question went um, right where Graham's head did, and it's not something the Cannabis Control Board specifically has control over, which is designated this as a different category of products might give folks in this state with powerful right to farm laws um, on the books a little bit more. Um, you know, cover ability to, to do as they wish. I mean, then to Jacob's point, you know, I think what we can do currently as a board is when we get to the point where folks are seeking an application and want to, to be part of this market, I don't know off the top of my head if, if Vermont has like a landlords association or some iteration that is, you know, that, that looks and feels like, you know, an, a formal or informal association of, of landlords, but, you know, we can certainly have discussions with them, uh, make sure that they understand our guidance and our rules and regulations and do what we can to, 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 pro to provide a degree of comfort um, to folks that would be leasing you know, commercial or farm or agricultural land to, um, to folks that want to participate here. So, I mean, that's something we can do, you know, given, given the way things currently are. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, yeah. uh, a few minutes left, so I wanted to move on. Um, yeah. So I guess does anyone have anything else to say on this? Oh, like, have you still got your hand raised, or is that from? Do yeah, I have a two things? Um, oh, not two things. Um, so one was you said at the beginning that compliance folks should visit a home grow. I guess I'm confused about that. That just makes sure the number of plants. Are you talking about code enforcement with a home grow? I mean, I don't. I was the impression that home grow didn't have any regulations around it. Um, number one. Um, number two, um, just going to say that the, the, the issue for just the portion of enforcement isn't just trying to litigation, it's around consumption. If consum consumption isn't allowed in public places, and it's, it's only allowed in your private home, or it's only for them or allows you to do it. So that's a, a huge issue. There's not any publicly allowed things to consume. You don't own your own home or own land to do it on. Well, um, the question about enforcement. I have one more thing, but I'll leave it there for the camera. Yeah, so when I was talking about the enforcement aspect of it, I was kind of just talking generally, um, but there is a plant uh, limit, right, for home growth? Yes. Yeah, so that's kind of what I was referring to, is that if someone is, you know, cleared out an entire basement and is growing, you know, 20 plants, 50 plants, like, that's not legal, so how does that get resolved? And ideally, Swap and not get involved, you know, or police, but having it be a municipal code enforcement violation. So it's more of a take it, depending on the reasons of the event, but of just kind of de escalating the issue at the beginning. Uh, so, you know, you're not, you know, further arresting, you know, a marginalized community, you know, just legalized cannabis, and I was throwing people back in jail for it. That's kind of where um, I was going with that. Absolutely. Thank you. That, that makes I a lot more sense. Yeah, the last thing I'm going to say, we have a constituent call in about homegrown particular 
He's a food safety um, worker. He works across the U.S. ensuring agricultural production standards. And he was saying that he's just seen a real issue with homegrown cannabis. And from a product quality perspective, from how people are growing, and just recognizing this technical support, needs to also reach those home, that home-growing community in, in order to both assure that they're growing in an environmentally sustainable way, but also such that they're creating products that's safe for consumption. Um, and it's not that that support is available for those folks. Perfect. All right. Thank you. So, um, do you have a question for me? Yeah. Did you know how they deal um, with additional patients? Because there are some additional patients that don't own their own home. And obviously, for a medicinal purpose, they would need to be able to smoke um, the product. Um, a great question. You know, if, if there's any laws around, around that, Right now, that's a great question and, and great point of reference. I think for this conversation, Dean and I do not know the answer off the top of my head. But with caregivers growing for you know other patients that are part of the medical program, and also those medical patients taking part in the medical program, I'm sure that this is not the first time this issue has come up. And you know, I can ask Lindsay, who runs the medical program, how they typically um, handle handle this issue and what kind of exceptions. Are made, you know. That being said, it's 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 medical a medical condition, so there might be more of an ability to over rule or override, or I'm going to use the wrong term there, but the landlord or whoever, you know, is owning the property. I don't know, but it's a good point of point of reference to start. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe some of that structure can be moved down to social equity candidates who, you know, want to smoke in their own homes as well. That, that's a good Do point. Do you have anyone for? A public I, I checked in the room. There's one member of the public. They did not have a public comment to submit. Um, but Gina, I don't. And remind me because everything's kind of wonky with the subcommittees right now. Are you meeting with the social equity committee um, again this week, tomorrow? Yeah. Would you? I'm gonna. I'll run some 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 questions through my internal processes. But if you would bring that kind of proxy com as, as part of this conversation to the social equity conversation on Thursday or at least mention it, um, that I think would be helpful too. Yeah, I agree. All right, um, I'm gonna skip over the uh, pesticide use hand, or mostly pesticide use. Um, Stephanie has sent me uh, everything dealing with hemp. I did have some questions on that, but I'll connect with you offline um, about it, and we can kind of, I think, deal with that as we're working on reports. So I wanted to kind of give you an opportunity. Um, I know, um, you need to start putting bringing reports to the board and had talked to me um, and I think Billy was meeting about kind of license application requirements. So um, yeah, I wanted to kind of give you the floor to talk about that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. And I'll be quick because I know I've, I've reached out to Stephanie and Billy um, individually uh, up to this point as well. And just kind of a brief um, overview of what I'm talking about is, you know, we'll have our basic application so and everything that you would expect to be in an application um, will be there from physical address contact info so on financial in information so on and so forth and then there's other kind of checklist items that we would look to include as, as what we're calling these additional baseline items that you would have to include in your um, in your application stephanie i know one of those things that the hemp program does is look for gis coordinates because in vermont we can be remote we can have no cell service we want to make sure folks can find these cultivation sites um, regardless of a physical address, recognizing also that these cultivation tiers will have a specific square footage and we need to make sure that we understand where specifically that cultivation site is and how big it is. And so, you know, and, and obviously that information would be kept confidential um, and, and away from a public, public records request because there's a lot of security issues that would go into um, having that information be discoverable. But I'm thinking also in terms of and Billy, I've talked to you about this. You know, we, we've talked in various different meetings about what letters of support or ability to serve letters uh, would be needed depending on the size and type of your um, operation from a utility company, from local municipal officials for potable water, wastewater. You know, if you're a big outdoor facility, do you need uh, and you need to adjust your permit for your well or your sewer? Um, well, we need to see that type of information and, and I think at this point I've kind of gathered I think uh, my thoughts um, 
after speaking with everybody here individually, but, but if any, anything has occurred um, to you, what makes sense, what is the direction we shouldn't go? I don't wanna make this overly prescriptive or overly burdensome, but at the end of the day, I think we do need to ensure that some, I don't wanna create this, this system where somebody's coming to us and they haven't already reached out to their local municipalities, then there's this constant back and forth and triangle between the board, the local officials, and an applicant trying to get them moved correctly through the system. So what makes sense to talk about before they come to us? What makes sense to talk about you know, on the back end? At the same time, I wanna make sure businesses have a thought, short-term and long-term, about their viability, what their goals are, how, you know, not necessarily a, a, a business plan per se or a SWOT analysis, but you know what what's the what's the line here to help folks from and, and I'm thinking about this in the sustainability cultivation context, so that's why I'm asking this committee, you know, to to include um, in addition to those kind of general you know boilerplate application materials. Yeah, so Kyle, on that, I'm going to share my screen real quick. So. Um, uh, I do have a bit of a hard stop at this, so um, I'm going to have to jump off and check them off. I'm going to use a tweet to the minutes. Okay, perfect. You got to take them up over email. Um, Thanks, Billy. And I can connect with you offline later. And, and Kyle, I did, you know, after our conversation this morning, I did put some specific questions out to the various water, wastewater, on-site municipal program leads to get feedback. So I asked for that by like noon tomorrow. So I'll get it to you as soon as I can at that timeline. So okay. That's a great timeline for me. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm running into uh, a new computer. Um, I'm getting access to I to be able to screen share the recording. Um, but I will send this around. Um, so yeah, I think what I was planning on doing for you know, I think everything was read, um, start reading the report. So I'm gonna do that in Teams so we can all collaborate on it and add in this as a specific section for each thing. So we can start to compile that information for you. Um, and then right when we get off the call, I'll send you this California cultivation plan that the state created. Um, I think we'll provide some insights. I've got a bunch of these from different states on uh, kind of the checklist that they're providing um, to uh, applicants. Great. Great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, everyone. Awesome. Thanks so much, Billy. Uh, thank you, Graham, for taking the time. Have a good day. Thank um, you, Graham. This was really great. Well, cool. thank you, Stephanie, and everyone else for, for joining. Thanks. Thanks, Billy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And this, uh, Jacob, do you have a minute? Yep. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, meeting adjourned at um, 